Okay, we're going to we're going to go ahead and get started here, um, and we're continuing in the task of looking at faith and works together. A series that started a little while ago. Um, I believe all the rest of these are already up on YouTube and SoundCloud, but uh, if they're not, you can remind me. And uh, this one goes in there too. We're going to look at the letter of Romans. We looked last time at First John. I think Romans is another one you have to look at when you're talking about this topic, um, having first established that God does expect obedience and never has expected anything different. And it's frankly preposterous to think that we would not need to do what God says. Jesus himself said, why call me Lord and don't do what I say. So, um, let me get over here into Romans in my, in my electronic device. The reason for looking at the, um, at the letter to Rome is that there is a great deal of confusion in the world, I would say, about some of the things that are written there. And I suppose we should take to heart what Peter said about this in 2 Peter 3 that Paul's letters sometimes have things that are hard to understand, and the untaught and unstable twist them to their own destruction. So we take a warning that mm, that could happen, and Romans is one of the places where that could happen, so it's important to get it straight. But it's also not terribly difficult to get it straight either, so let's take a look. Um, one of the things that I think should be noted uh, fairly early is Romans 1 7 that this letter is written to those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints these are the Christians these are the people who have already obeyed the gospel they do not need to be instructed in how to obey the gospel they have already done so so um, that's an important thing to keep in mind it is also the case that in Rome you will have both Jews and non-Jews a.k.a. Gentiles, um, and that is actually what the letter is about. So the main trick, uh, if you will, or the main secret to understanding this is that what the letter is really focused on is the difference between the law of Moses and the law of Christ. References to the law and references to works um, of the law um, especially when they are opposed, if you will, or set in opposition to faith and the works of the faith and the spirit are not actually setting obedience and disobedience. They're setting Judaism and the teaching today in Christ. They're setting the, the law of Moses and the law of Christ. Um, what is meant by the spirit, what is meant by the faith, um, is the law of Christ. And in fact, what people usually do is misunderstand that as obedience or no necessity of obedience, on the other hand. And that's a very big mistake. Uh, the Lord would never make it okay for us not to obey him. So, okay, we've noted that, first of all, Romans 1, 7, it is the fact that these who have um, obeyed the gospel are the recipients of the letter. Now, the next thing is in verse 13. I don't want you to be unaware, brothers, Romans 1, 13 begins, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles, I am under obligation both to Greeks and barbarians, to wise and to foolish. I am eager, therefore, to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. 
For I am not ashamed of the gospel, it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. This is the meaning of the letter. <laughs> he sets it out at the beginning. The, the Greek, if you will, is the Gentile, the Roman, and the barbarian. Whoever is afar off. It's not just for the Jews, although it is for the Jews first, but the time has come and it's been opened up according to Acts 10. Uh, Peter recognized this and those in Jerusalem did, but, but Paul was never under any other uh, understanding or circumstance. He always was preaching among the Gentiles. This is what the letter is actually saying and what it's, the, the, uh, the distinction that it's actually drawing. So the first chapter begins to go into how is it that Gentiles are accountable to God? How are the nations accountable, right? That's why he begins to say what he does in the 18th. The wrath of God has been revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They're suppressing it. For what can be known about God is plain to them because he's shown it to them. His invisible attributes, specifically eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made. So they're without excuse. Though they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him. Rather, they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. This is how all the nations have corrupted ourselves. This is how it is to live without God in this world. That's all he's saying. Why are they accountable? Because God has made himself known by the creation. You can see the heavens declare the glory of God. Uh, you can see the, the order and um, uh, reliability, I guess, predictability of the seasons, the times, the, everything comes together. The design of everything that has been made, the intricacies of it. This tells you that there is God. Then it's incumbent upon you to seek him out. But he has also made it so that he is not far from us, and we should find him and we should seek him, according to Acts 17. Therefore, everybody on earth is accountable. That's all he's saying. Every, all of the nations are accountable, even those who didn't have the law of Moses to spurn. <laughs> they didn't even know that it existed. But then it turns immediately in the second chapter. Therefore, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, because in passing judgment on another you condemn yourself. You, the judge, practice the very same things. Who are we talking to? Right? Who is Paul talking to? What is this about? Does this mean we should never judge anybody? Well, no, it doesn't mean that any more than Jesus meant that in Matthew 7. No. The judgment of God rightly falls on people who practice such things. Do you suppose, man, who judge those practicing such things and yet do them yourselves, that you will escape? What is he talking about? If you look... It's verse 9. There will be tribulation and distress, Romans 2, 9. For every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek. That's a reference directly back to chapter 1. For the Jew first and also for the Greek. Salvation, but also tribulation and distress for everyone who does evil. What do we mean by that? Glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek, because God shows no partiality. Acts 10, I, Peter said, I now perceive that in every nation, whoever fears him is acceptable. He shows no partiality. And Romans 2, 12, all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. It's not the hearers of the law who are righteous before God, but the doers of the law who will be justified. 
Now, here's one of the places where I will be critical of your translation because it's probably just like mine in that um, they decide when they're going to capitalize things, right? In the original, there are no capitals. It's just ancient Greek, did, there was no case. There were just letters. <laughs> there was no capitals. You had to decide what things meant and what was important, things of this nature. Our translators usually do use them, and uh, in this case, I take issue because they should have capitalized the letter L in the law at Romans 12 and Romans 13 and Romans 14. Uh, I'm sorry, in, in the verses 12, 13, 14. In fact, every, pretty much every single place where the word occurs in the letter to the Romans, it should be the capital L law because it's literally talking about the law of Moses not this abstract concept of law, which is where people go. They immediately go to, oh, well, see, you don't have to keep law. There is no law, there's no obedience. That's not what it's saying at all, friend. It's saying you don't have to keep the law of Moses. That doesn't mean you're lawless. <laughs> all who have sinned without the law of Moses will also perish without the law of Moses. And those who have sinned under the law of Moses will be judged by the law of Moses. It's not the hearers of the law of Moses who are just before God, the judge. It is the doers of the law of Moses who will be made just. This is what he's talking about, and that's why the 24th verse, or I'm sorry, the 14th verse says what it does. When Gentiles who don't have the law of Moses by nature do what the law of Moses requires. They are a law to themselves, even though they don't have the law of Moses. They show that the work of the law of Moses is written on their hearts. This is all he's saying is people were capable of living right without the law of Moses. Some people did what was right. Even if they didn't know Moses and didn't have those things, they, they were still capable of doing right. And there were many that we know of whom God spoke to the way that he always had spoken with heads of households and with fathers. That was real. That happened. And that's all that the rest of that is. But again, back to our main point at verse 17. This is what we're really saying. <laughs> this is a sucker punch, right? This is a sucker punch. All he's saying is, you know, in chapter one, oh, I do want to come talk to you guys at Rome too, because I got, I am a debtor to even the barbarians, you know, even people who don't know Latin. <laughs> um, and then he goes on to how they should have known that God existed, you know, and that you got to know. There's some Jews in that crowd who were like, yeah, get him, Paul. You know, and this is how they carved things out of animals and thought that that was God. Yeah, yeah, you get him. Right, they're, they're back there cheering. Suddenly it turns to, well, you can't do the same things and judge. And they're like, well, yeah, no, of course not. Yeah, you, you can't do that, of course, right? And then he says... You know, even if they didn't have the law, they're still accountable. Those who had the law died and didn't keep it died by the law. Those who didn't have the law were nonetheless accountable. And now they're thinking, hmm, that's not possible because the whole world is framed through our lens. <laughs> our country is the only country. And then he says, but if you call yourself a Jew and rely on the law of Moses and boast in God, you know his will. You approve what is excellent because you have been instructed from the law of Moses. You're sure that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those in darkness, instructor of the foolish, teacher of children, having in the law of Moses the embodiment of knowledge and truth, the embodiment of knowledge and truth. You then who teach others, don't you teach yourself? While you preach against stealing, do you steal? And they say, well, no, I, I don't steal. You who say one, uh, or, or, yeah, 
You who say one must not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Well, no, no, of course not. Uh, you who abhor idols, do you rob temples? Well, that's different. See, that's where this is going. Well, that's different. How is that different? Well, that's justice. Now, we're, we're attacking the idol and taking it down. Okay, interesting. Is that also why you committed fornication with a temple prostitute so you could gain access to the inner circle? Oh yeah, yeah, we were just double agents. Aha, uh -huh, interesting. <laughs> you who boast in the law dishonor God by breaking the law. The name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you. That's what this is really about. This whole letter is about this. And all the topics that follow. Okay, so let's lay this out first, that the first two chapters make everything very clear. And that's a good place to start. I know there's a lot of the letter left. That's fine. There's not that much material, actually. Um, just as, uh, as long as we understand um, in, the, in the beginning here that the letter is written to Christians. Some of the Christians obeyed from the nations, whatever religions or lack thereof they might have had. Others of these Christians have obeyed from the law of Moses. And they lived together. And it seems right that those who were brought up with the law of Moses should be teachers. They should know. Israel should be, you know, the, the world's priest. Um, having been brought up in the law. I mean, what he, what Paul says that is kind of exoriating them um, in 17 to, to 22 should be accurate, though. <laughs> Even though they're thinking to themselves, yes, you know, you all should be glad that, that we are here. <laughs> it should be true, though. <clears throat> they should know his will and approve what is excellent. They should have been instructed from the law from the time they were little. Um, they should be able to help those who are blind uh, and those who are in darkness. And that's the thing. Uh, those who are the people of God should have these qualities and should have these characteristics about them. But this particular um, group does not. They're, they've, they're riding um, the coattails of this pattern and this prophecy that they should be the priests of God, that they should be um, healing for the nations. Um, but in fact, they are not, um, they're not capable of teaching the Gentiles when this is the attitude about it. They think of themselves as better than and the Gentiles as other than. And they think, you know, that people should be glad that they're there and should listen to them and that they really know and the Gentiles, they're Johnny come lately and, you know, their parents are not good people and, you know, it's all, I mean, that's just how things are. That's human nature. And if you want to go there, uh, as I always do, um, <laughs> Jew and Gentile today doesn't exist, right? There's no nation of Israel from ancient times in the scriptures, right? There's, there's a modern, you know, recollection of people, but it's not like what this was. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of integration is not really at issue. Today, what this is, is people whose parents are Christians, they're the Jews today. And everything you read about in the Bible that talks about Jew and Gentile relations and uh, speaks to the Jew and the one who knows the law, you know, if your parents are Christians, that's you. You're thinking, I'm a Gentile. I mean, I've got a German last name or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, if your parents are Christians, you're a Jew for the purposes of the New Testament. That's, you're the person who's been brought up knowing the law. 
hearing the teaching of the truth, um, you know, approving what is excellent, uh, right? This is the idea. So if you want to go there, that's how you go there. That's what it's, when the, where the rubber hits the road today. It's easy, I think, to kind of leave that academic as a problem that obtained in the ancient world, in, you know, at the cultural, the cultural estuary of these two, uh, you know, uh, coming together, the integration of Jew and Gentile. But, but no, um, it's very much alive and well. All the things you read about here, they happen all the time in the churches. Um, it's just that the actors are a little bit different, you know, that's the deal. Which is not to say it's wrong to have Christians who are par uh, parents who are Christians. Uh, that's good. Uh, that's a wonderful blessing. I'm just saying, if you're looking for where do I fit into the scheme here, that's where you fit. If, if your parents are Christians, you were raised in this, you are the Jew. Um, for those of us whose parents were not Christians, who came in from outside, we are the Gentiles. And it should be the case that those who are brought up by Christians should know his will, should approve what is excellent, should have been instructed from the law. Now, you and I both know better than that. In a lot of churches, they're not being instructed from the law at all. They're being taught a bunch of gobbledygook. <laughs> But they should be taught the law, and they should know what is right. And it ought to be a great blessing. All right, so let us move on then. The bottom line is 26 of this chapter, Romans 2. If a man uncircumcised keeps the precepts of the law of Moses, won't his circum uncircumcision be regarded just as well as circumcision would have been? He who is physically uncircumcised but keeps the law of Moses will condemn you who have the written code and circumcision but break the law of Moses. For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew rather is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. This one's praise is not from man, but from God. And you can see what, <laughs> for one thing, you can see how this is the temptation for the Jews in that time. I mean, even John the Baptist told them, don't even begin to think to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. God can raise children to Abraham from the rocks around here. The ax is laid to the root of the tree. Right. You're just like, forget about that. It has nothing to do with your physical lineage. Right. You can see the, the temptation for that. And I dare say, you can see how well that applies in the churches as well. Right. He's not a Christian who is one outwardly. He is a Christian who is inwardly. That circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. The praise is not from man, but from God. And yet people seek the approval of Men, they seek the approval of brethren instead of the approval of God. That's why there are false teachers whose names we all know, who are well known and well respected and well supported. Because the people love to have that. So, when they do this, they are Jews outwardly only. They have the physical trappings of being the people of God because there are no musical instruments in here. You won't see any musical instruments. And some of them even say they're non-institutional. They won't do their whatever, their orphanages and old folks' homes and whatever else. Okay, but there's a lot more to the faith than this. And you start to notice with these people that, you know, physical things are just too important. You know? Looking back over the years, I think of the people who have left the congregation at South Austin. Uh, you know, what percentage of those people complained that the grass was too long and people didn't mow it often enough? I would say upwards of 
I heard that complaint from just about everybody I can think of who left. Dare I say that you are paying attention to the wrong thing? We don't even have grass now. Now what are you complaining about? Actually, don't tell me. <laughs> we'll come up with something, I'm sure. <laughs> but you know what I'm getting at, right? It has an outward appearance of order, an outward appearance of, you know, what is seemly among men, which is actually just what brethren have convinced themselves is seemly based on, you know, debates of the past positions that are widely adopted and held by other churches because the praise is coming from man, not from God. This is the issue. It's always been the issue, actually. <laughs> so, as we speak about faith and works, first thing we need to get straight is God has no such question. There is no faith and works with him. They're the same thing. Romans, to begin with, is um, about the law of Moses. The reality, if you will, the substance of the spiritual nature of our living. And it's very interesting to think about it this way because John's problem in 1 John is people were saying they could serve God in the spirit while doing otherwise in the flesh, that the two are not connected, they're divorced from one another. That's clearly false. And John spent a lot of time showing us how that is false and why. Various and sundry things, chief among which is that Jesus had flesh. Well, in Romans, it's the other way around. These have what seems to be physical works of righteousness. The kosher eating comes up in Romans 14 and the holidays, which are in and of themselves, they're clean. You can do that if you want to, but that doesn't make you right before God, eating or not eating some unkosher meat, observing or not observing some day off, does not have any impact on the spirit. So they, you know, this is an interesting thing. It's the other way around. For First John, it's you guys just think that you don't have to obey and you just do whatever you want. In Romans, it's the other way. These think that this matters and they make bones over this thing that's actually just their national cultural heritage, not what the Bible requires them to do in the New Testament. So it's, and we got more to talk about, and we will, but this is how it relates to faith and works. They're, they're seeing this as this is the, the gospel of God. This is the bound thing. <laughs> uh, I remember one of the older preachers saying, you know, the perfect term is members of the church. I'm like, well, why is that the perfect terminology for describing it? Because there's not another way to describe this that is talking about what we are doing here. I thought, this is very odd. You're taking like a political, philosophical, um, American dialogue approach to naming this, uh, when actually, you know, if you're going to do this through the scriptures, we're members of the body in 1 Corinthians, members of one another, but that's not what he was talking about. Yeah, I know. I know that's not what you're talking about. That's what I'm trying to say is what you're saying is odd. That didn't come from the Bible. <laughs> but, eh. Faith and works, they are real. But notice Romans 2.28 again in closing, no one is a Jew who is one outwardly nor is circumcision outward and physical. The Jew is one inward. Circumcision is a matter of the heart. Yes. It's not enough to go through the motions or to abstain from certain things. Um, to look like it's righteous from all outside appearances. It's about who are you? <laughs> what is your heart? What is your soul? Um, we talked in the, in the class 
today about, you know, we have to stop thinking about ourselves, if you will, as humans <laughs> in, some, in some measure and start thinking about ourselves as spirits. We are living spirits. You know, it wasn't just Jesus who took on flesh. Uh, the Holy Spirit took on flesh in the form of a dove. Luke records in the baptism of Jesus. We are spirits and we have taken on flesh too. And this is also temporary flesh, but our spirit will live on forever. It's not what is outward. It is what is inward. We got to be thinking spiritually and come to realize that we are spirits in the flesh. So there's no more clear indicator of what a spirit is and what a spirit is about than what it causes to happen in the flesh that it inhabits. That's the meaning of this. You as a spirit are driving this body and what this body does um, is a result of what your spirit is. That's why we're judged by everything that is done in the body, whether it is good or whether it is evil, because that's the thing that indicates your spirit. He is not a Jew who is one outwardly. He is a Jew who is one inwardly. All right. Well, we have more to talk about, and that's enough for today. We'll close it at Romans 2. We'll come back to 3. We do need to talk about, you know, predestination and Romans 9. We need to talk about um, some of the... the uh, selection of nations in uh, Romans 11. We should talk about the wretched man that I am, Romans 7 to Romans 8, but you already know the answer. There's no escape under the law of Moses. There's no forgiveness of sins. That's all he's saying in Romans 7. <laughs> Where is the escape? It's in the perfect law of liberty. It's in the grace. It's in the faith. That is Jesus. That doesn't mean you don't obey. It means you stop being under the law of Moses and become a Christian. But we have a lot to talk about in those regards. We'll come back to it. Thank you for your kind attention. And today, if you have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus, it is time to do so. High time. If you know that you are not right with God, you need to make things right with God because there's no promise of tomorrow. There's no promise of later today. If we can help you to obey in baptism for forgiveness of sins. We will go with you. We will find the water necessary to get you buried, to put to death the old person of sin and be resurrected in the spirit, a new creature created in Christ Jesus for good works. If today as a Christian you haven't lived right, let us help you with our prayers. Either way, please let your need be known by coming to the front while we stand and sing.